All right, we're going to get right back into apologetics. This will be the first class of the new semester um, dealing with apologetics. We'll be dealing uh, with the Islam nation. Last semester, we dealt with the Catholic Church, we dealt with the Mormons, and we dealt with the Jehovah's Witnesses, and we began some uh, on the Islam faith. Now, on, your, in, on chapter 16, and I'm just going to give you this for reference. You can write it down. So that way, we want to look it up. But page 435 of the textbook that you have, which is the Kingdom of the Cults. And if you don't have that, if maybe you're listening somewhere else, you don't have that book, it's an easy book to get. You can order it. You can get it anywhere. Uh, I would recommend getting the updated version, which has been updated by Zacharias. And it's, a, uh, it's completely uh, up to date as far as uh, changes with the, um, uh, the different uh, denominations because they tend to change their doctrines occasionally. Just to give you an overview quickly of uh, the Islam faith, things to know about Islam is Islam is the second largest religion in the world. It's second to the um, Christian uh, Christianity, which we are. Uh, when you consider that, it's kind of scary because if Christianity is the largest uh, religion in the world, uh, and in my mind, probably 80% of, 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 of Christianity is not truly Christianity, and I mean that by no offense to our, our Catholic friends, but uh, our Catholic friends are not truly Christian because they're doing so many things that Christ wouldn't do. They're praying to saints, they're worshiping idols, they're, they're praying to Mary, they're doing a lot of those things and they're really depending on themselves for their way to heaven. So when you take away all those folks from Christianity, then it really, to me, puts the Muslim faith at the top. It's, one of the, it's, the, it's the largest uh, group of people because if you subtract the Catholic Church from Christi Christianity, we're a very small number in the world, and, and, I'm, and I'm not saying that every Catholic's not saved. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying every Catholic's not going to heaven. I'm saying that there are a lot of folks, particularly when you go into third world countries, that blindly follow the faith, and if they, if they told them that they needed to all paint their houses blue with purple polka dots, and that would be the way to heaven, they'd get out there with a roller and a paintbrush, and they would do it because they, they feel like otherwise they'd be excommunicated, kicked out of the church, and wouldn't go to heaven. And if you're depending on going to heaven based on what uh, somebody has uh, told you to do and you got to do it that, that's just not salvation and so in my mind the Muslim faith is probably the largest religion in the world I mean it probably is the largest and uh, it's uh, it's certainly uh, growing here in America it's the fastest growing religion here in America and it's growing in our area uh, at a non-stop breakneck pace uh, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the prophet or messenger of Allah that is the confession that the Muslims say faithfully day after day, day after day, day after day. You ever see the Muslims go to prayer and you'll see them, they'll, they'll, they'll get out five times a day and bow down toward Mecca and they'll pray that prayer and that's what they'll say. They'll say that, uh, that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his prophet. And so they are saying that, 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 that Allah is the only God and that Muhammad is his prophet. Now the problem with that is, is that throws Jesus Christ right out the door because if Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet then where does Jesus play into that part of it and so even though they'll tell you that Jesus is a prophet that Jesus is a, a preacher even though they say that Jesus is a good man and all those things they're essentially throwing out the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ because they claim that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his prophet and when you consider that it's a scary thought. More than 1,800,000,000 people worldwide claim Allah as their God. You think about that number, 1,800,000,000. That's, that's almost 2 billion people of the same faith. Now, in some ways, that's a scary thought. It's scary uh, because of their, their, their spiritual beliefs. It's scary that almost 2 billion people are, are relying on a a false god for salvation. It's also scary because of the mantra of this of this religion. It's uh, it's not like having two billion Hindus. You know, Hindus. Uh, many of you know that Gandhi was a Hindu. I don't know if you know Gandhi's story. Gandhi's considered one of the great leaders of our society that's ever been. And one of Gandhi's uh, tenets was he wanted change, but they didn't want change through warfare. They wanted change through uh, activism. And so Muhammad, and most of you know that Gandhi would not eat until peace came. And of course he starved himself. But 
he would not take up arms and he would not fight you over what he wanted to achieve. He would just simply protest what he wanted to achieve. The problem with the Muslim faith or the Islam faith is that not only do they want change, but they are willing in some cases to force change. And so it's scary not only that they're following a false doctrine and it's losing their salvation in that way, but it's also scary that two billion people are convinced that their faith is so right that they would kill you over their faith being right. And, and that's really a scary thing. And the many of us here in America, the first time we were ever really introduced to the Muslim faith, and I'll just be honest with you, I won't, I won't lie about it a bit. I, we never studied Muslims or Islam really in my life until uh, September 11th. I mean, we never really thought about 9-11. I mean, until 9-11, we never thought about the Islam faith. I mean, how many people really worried about the Muslim faith? Well, none of us were. I mean, you're just not something that you sit around and worried about. You didn't even see them. And then all of a sudden, uh, these men come out and they, they, they get these planes and they, of course, attack our, our buildings. And what's scary about it is they're willing to give their own life. They're willing to sacrifice their life to take away the life of infidels. And, of course, when we see that the kind of behavior, it's a scary thing. It's, it's really a scary thing. Uh, a, a good friend of mine or a friend of mine I've known for a long time, Victor, and, and I, I, hopefully if you're, on, if you're listening, uh, don't, go, don't go tell him I said this. I love him to death, but uh, he runs the Italian Garden here in, in, in York, and uh, he is a Muslim, and he's from Syria, and he's come from a very oppressive people. He'll, he'll tell you about how awful it is to live in Syria, how that the government and the people there will just uh, take what you have. If you have something, they want it, they'll come get it. If you're walking down the street with your daughter and the king's son pulls up and wants your daughter they'll just put her in the car and take off with her you never see her again that's just how that's how the country lives in he'll go through how awful it is and how they treat people and how they work with people and then he doesn't realize that the government is a muslim government and that the faith that he defends is the reason that they are so tyrannical in that area because the muslim faith says convert do what allah says or die that's the i mean that's just their, the way they run things and he'll say oh no no those guys that that f crashed into those towers they were a radical set of muslims that's what they tell you and, and we find out now after all these years of course it's been a long time that that uh that uh, uh, Osama bin Laden had went to the to the to the Muslim clerics. Now this is not hearsay. This is facts. He went to the to them and said, "Hey, I want permission to kill a million, a million <coughs> heretics." <laughs> and they said, "Let us pray about it." And they come back and said, "Yes, we'll let you do that." Now that's <clears throat> here's a group of people giving commission to kill now he didn't say i'm gonna go do it in new york <clears throat> but he was asking permission to kill uh infidels now here's the here's the key to that it wouldn't matter if it was in tokyo sri lanka it wouldn't matter if it was in russia or america killing people was wrong i mean that's just how it is and 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 here we find that they had given him the green light now they didn't tell him where and when and all that but they gave him the green light to do those things. And so it's not only scary that uh, 2 billion people are following a false doctrine, James. It's scary that 2 billion people follow a very militant doctrine. Now, I believe just like anything, there are a million uh, Muslims who, like my friend, that, that, that they, don't have any, they don't have a militant bone in their body. He, he gets up every morning and does what he's supposed to do and what he thinks is right. He's a good guy. He's, he's a, a safe guy, a friendly guy. But he is the minority, not the majority. And I, and I think that's what we have. He's an American Muslim, which is generally a lot different than a Far Eastern uh, Muslim. And so we, we see a, a great difference. Let me give you a couple uh, definitions, and I want you to get this. The very word Islam is an, an Arabic term for submission. When you consider that the very name Islam says submission, that, that's what you are. You are submitted to the faith of of Allah submitted now the Bible calls us disciples does it not a disciple is, is it follows it learns it it emulates it tries to be like we are not slaves to God does everybody understand we, we're quite the opposite the Bible says that we were slaves of sin and that Jesus set us free he said you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free and so here's the key uh, uh, we, we we were we were prisoners who have now been set free does that does that make sense 
We have been people who were, who were submitted, who are now free. It's the difference of the slaves in the 1800s who were working in the field being beat and worked, and, and they get that freedom from that. Now they're free people. That, that's the type that we are. We're, we're a type of freedom. God, when he saved you, he, he loosed you from the world, and, and, and he saved you. And the Bible says that you became free from sin and that you could serve the Lord. And that's a great, that's a great story. Not only that, but we are free from the sin. But the Bible says we've been made a child of God. And being a child is really a great thing. Who takes who cares for you more than your father cares for you? Who loves you more than your parents love you? Nobody. And and so we find that we've been set free, but the but the but the doctrine of Islam is that you have been submitted under them. To be is a, to be an Islam or to be a Muslim is to be submitted to them. And so the Christianity is totally different. I'm preaching, hey, become a Christian, be set free. The Muslim faith is preaching, submit to us, submit to our authority, submit to our law. That's what they're preaching. We're preaching grace and peace and love and truth. They're preaching submission. And when you think about that, it's a horrible, horrible thing. You can see that when you look over into the foreign countries, how their women dress. They, they, they've got, they, they own their wives. I mean, their wives are property to them. I mean, that, that's, that, that's just the way it is. You, you, people can say what they want and do what they want, but if they weren't the largest religion in the world, there would be an outcry against the Muslim faith for how they treat the ladies because here's the bottom line. There's many times that our country has stepped in in cases of genocide over in Africa, Somalia, where the, uh, the Somalians and, and, and who was it they were fighting? They were trying to kill off one of the other. I don't remember which one it was, but there was two groups of, they, they look like both European groups, but one was trying to kill off the other group, and America went in under Bill Clinton and stopped them and said, hey, you can't just kill whole villages because they're a different nationality from you. You can't do that. That's a human rights thing. You don't do that. You don't, you don't uh, treat people that way. If we knew of an area uh, where children were being killed by the thousands, experimented on, and all these things, we would go in and we would do something about it. We would never allow that to go on. But when you look across in Iraq and Iran and all these, all these Muslim places, we see the ladies over there, it is legal to beat women. It's legal to sell women. It's legal to have multiple wives. And, and, and it's legal to force them to dress in those big barca, what do they call them? Big, uh, uh, what is it? A burkas that they wear where all they have is a little slot and, and they got a little uh, mesh where you can see through. If they weren't two billion people strong, we would do something about it. But I believe that we're afraid of what the, what the ramifications would be. But, that, but it's submission to be in the Islam faith, you must be submitted. Muslim is a name given to someone who adheres to the religion of the Islam. So to be Islam is a submitted person. A Muslim is somebody who has gone under that and become submitted to the, to the faith of the Islam people. Allah is their term for God. They believe that no other term we can refer to God in the proper way that it was said. That Allah is some name that they believe that gives him a unique perspective. And that when we say God, that we're not giving him the correct glory that he deserves. You'll find sometimes in cults that you'll sense that. The Jehovah's Witnesses are the same way in some ways. They believe that God's only name is Jehovah and that any other name is not God. And you're not, you're not calling him by your proper name. The Muslims believe that in the same way. They don't believe that our term God meets the standard of what he should be called because Allah is an Arabic name. And of course we know that that's not simply not the truth. Muhammad is an Arab that was born in the city of Mecca in A.D. 570, and he died at uh, 632 A.D. And so Muhammad is the one that claims to be the only prophet of Allah. The Quran is spelled, you'll see it most of the time, Q-U-R apostrophe A-N. Now that's a, that is a term that they use today, but the, the, most, the older spelling and, the more, and what used to be the most common, you'll see it spelled K-O-R-A-N. And there's no difference between the two, there's no difference between the two uh, documents. One's just a newer name 
than the other one is. Now, the Quran is unique in that, that it's kind of like the Bible. It has been translated by many, many people, and it's been translated according to what they want it to say. Does that, does that, do you understand what I mean by that? If you're one sect, you translate it one way, and if you're another sect, you translate it your way, and that's, been, that's happened too. So sometimes you'll try to use a Quran uh, surah, is what they call it, that you'll say surah number 142, whatever. They'll say, oh no, that's not what my Quran says. My Quran says X, Y, or Z. But in essence, they're all the same. There's just the way it's been translated to whatever sect of Muslim happens to be reading it. Now, there are popular and more popular versions of the Quran than others, much like our Bible is today. But you'll find that the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons are both kind of in that same category. The, the Mormons uh, wanted, they got their own other Bible that they used. The, the Jehovah's Witness, they, they said, well, we don't like the, the Bible the way it is. So they had the whole, the New World Translation just printed, specifically written by Jehovah's Witness. Uh, so that it would line up ex specifically with what they believed. So they determined what they believed and then wrote their Bible. Does, does, does that make sense? I, I know that sounds kind of, but that's what happened and that's what they do. And so that way they have their version of it. I'll give you a couple other things here just as kind of things to know. Uh, a caliph, does anybody know a caliph is a leader of Islam? That, you know, we call them pastors, bishops. You'll hear those terms. Theirs is a caliph. That is their leader. That is a, they call it, it, it really it translates to deputy, but it's the main leaders of the Islam faith are called caliphs. And those are, you know, the Sunnis have their caliphs and the, 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 uh, the others have their caliphs. But that is the top, you know, that's the guys that uh, say somebody like Osama bin Laden would have to go to to get permission. They are the top of the Muslim faith since there is no Muhammad anymore. Does anybody have any questions about that? Do I? Oh, can I spell it? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. It's a C-A-L-I-P-H, Caliph. And uh, that's, what, uh, that's what they do. Speaking of that, we'll just give you a couple of schools of the, of the Islam. You'll find that <clears throat> Islam is much like Christianity. It's much like a lot of things, like the, the Mormon church is this way. There's a split. Whenever the, whenever the, the, the head guy dies, everything splits up. The problem with that is it's very much different than it is in Christianity in some ways. You see, in Christianity, although some things change because we have different religions, the leader of our church is still Jesus Christ. Does, does that make sense? We still get Jesus is still in charge of the church. The Bible is still in charge of what we believe. Now, somebody might go off and take a, def, a, a, a denomination and, 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 and interpret the Scripture in one way or may have another denomination that interprets it a different way. We may have more liberal or more, or more conservative, what we would call liberal conservative, uh, um, views on the Word of God, but what happens in, in cult following is because you're following a man, when the man dies, you have to pick a new man to follow, and see, that's where they'll kind of get moved around a little bit. Like when Joseph Smith died, there was, there was so many of them that followed the, uh, the Brigham Young to Utah, and there were so many of them that followed Joseph Smith's son down to Missouri, and of course, the, the Missouri Mormons are the ones that are, that are akin to Waco, Texas, and those deal, and those that we've seen lately where they're bringing out multiple wives and, and those kind of things, a lot of children. And of course, the Brigham Young sect is the mainstream LDS church that we find. Now, when it comes to this, the, the Islam faith, we have the first thought, which is the Sunnis. Have you ever heard that when you're watching the uh, news, you'll hear them talk about the Sunni Muslims? Well, the Sunni Muslims make up 90% of the Muslims in the Middle East. If you're in the M Middle East and you run into a Muslim, 90% of them are going to be Sunnis, and, and that's just kind of your biggest group of people. And what happened with them, and, and we'll talk about them in a minute, and then the second largest school is the Shiites. The Shiites are going to be your Iran, in, in Iran. For instance, the uh, president of Iran, what was his name? Go ahead and say that for me, James. His name's about that, about that long. You know what I'm talking about? The, he's, he's a, he is a, uh, he's going to be one of the uh, Shiite Muslims where in Iraq they're going to be Sunnis. And that's going, to be the, that's going to be the majority. Now, that's not in every case, but it, it'll be close. The Shiite Muslims are those who followed that when Muhammad died, they followed his son-in-law, the Muhammad's son-in-law, and they followed him. And that was what happened is they began to follow uh, the son-in-law 
of Muhammad. Does that does that make sense? He did not have a direct kin, uh, didn't direct son to follow. They followed his son-in-law, who kind of picked up the mantle, and they followed him. The others followed other people. So it kind of split there. Does that does that make sense? There was a big split. Now there's something that we find here unique with the uh, Shiites, and it's something that we should uh, take most uh, or, or take. Uh, notice of and that is that through uh, from Ali which is the son-in-law of Muhammad that there followed 12 imams does that does everybody understand what I mean when I say iman iman is the guy who they would call the prophet at that time so you had Muhammad died his son-in-law was was in charge and then he died and this iman was there and then he died and then another iman does, it, does everybody see what I'm talking about and it came all the way down to the 12th iman now the twelfth Amon has a has a the reason I'm going through that. It's not that we don't care, but there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is is that the the final Amon, <clears throat> the twelfth and final Amon, Muhammad disappeared when he was a child in AD 878. That means he disappeared. He was a little boy, <clears throat> and I guess he was he was the next in line. I guess it was through bloodship, and for whatever reason he disappeared, and they don't know what happened to him. Nobody knows where he went. Um, it's probably it's most certain that he died or was killed. I mean, I would I would I mean I I can't imagine of any any other course where here is a a leader of all these religious people just disappears. I mean, there's there there it's got to be there's got to be something, and they call him the hidden iman, and this hidden iman is supposed to um, he is supposed to reappear in, a, in, in at, at some time. In Iran, he's supposed to come back, and they have a uh, they have a mosque there built, and in this mosque, uh, people go and they pray, and they and they they worship, and they donate, and even the government of Iran funds this place because there's a well there, and and this this little boy is supposed to appear there again. He's the twelfth Iman, and the Muslim nations are looking for him to appear now. There's, there's many thoughts about that in my mind. I, I think about this very, very strongly. If you go to the book of Revelation, there's a city that's been that's being just blasted in that time in the book of Revelation. That city is the city of Babylon. I mean, God just wearing them out. God's talking about how awful they are, how horrible they are, how that they're a excuse the term, but basically a prostitute, a prostitute that's going around and, and seducing the world in, 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 in spiritual fornication. That, that's what he's saying. And this place, Babylon, is in a place called Iraq. And uh, in this place called Babylon is supposed to come a man that we all know as the Antichrist. And I wouldn't be shocked that two billion people who are already looking for this boy to show up as the twelfth Iman, I could see him either being one or two things. I could see him either being the Antichrist, or I could see him being the false prophet that encourages the Antichrist. Many people believe that the Antichrist will be on the scene. He will be the political, physical leader, and that all of a sudden a spiritual leader will arise and will basically give his uh, approval to the Antichrist and tell everybody under his following, hey, this is the guy we need to be waiting on. And so many people think the Antichrist will be here and that maybe this 12th Amman would show up. All the Islam nation would look to him and say, what should we do? And when he says, that is God, we should follow him, the thinking would be they would just rush after him. Now, I don't think it's an accident that the largest religion in the world is looking for a man who will make everything all right. I don't think that's like uh, some coincidence. I believe that that is a setup by Satan for these people to, when they see him, they won't even think about who it is. They'll just say, hey, that's got to be him. I mean, there won't even be a thought. They've been hearing about it for hundreds and thousands of years, and all of a sudden, here he appears. And so we see that the Muslims are looking for that person, and uh, we don't know, uh, we, I don't know what happened to him, uh, but we know that somebody, they're all looking for him. And so he, he disappeared. You know, the case is probably he was killed, and the killer was never, was never caught. There's a third school of Islam that is known as the Ishmaelites. And, of course, they're a smaller group. They're not as large. Uh, and they are owned and ran by a billionaire uh, with the last name Khan, K-H-A-N. And uh, who knows? We don't know if he's 
uh, legitimately a Muslim that's looking to somehow spread some kind of truth he believes there is, or sometimes rich people just like to have toys, and you know, and that's and that can be the case there as well. But those are your three primary groups of Muslims. You're gonna if you're gonna run into a Muslim, they're gonna fall in one of those three. You're probably never gonna run into an Ishmaelite Muslim. You're probably just never gonna see that. You're gonna see Sh- Sunnis and Shiites. That's going to be the two types of Muslims that you encounter. Here in America, you're going to find different strains of that, different strands of that. When you go over here to the, uh, to the compound that's built over here on Dr. Nichols Road, their, 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 their caliph or their, their, their uh, guy is from Pakistan. So they have a guy locally that's their whoever he is, but their, their main person is a Pakistanian um, caliph there. And so they're, they're going to be with him. Now, the FBI says that they're an extremely militant strain of the, of, the mis, of the Islam faith. And so when the FBI says that out of this whole militant faith that you're an extremely militant faith, then you're probably, probably pretty militant. And uh, you're not, you're not uh, uh, it's not like this an accident. You know, they, they don't just term people this way. Now, of course, the brief history of the, the, the Muslims is this, that, of course, we talked about this and we went through it in, at length and we won't go through it again, and that was that the Muslim people come from Ishmael, which was Abraham's son, uh, through, uh, through Hagar, his handmaid. And of, course, uh, of course, she was Egyptian, he was Jewish, they, they produced the Ishmaelite people. The Ishmaelite people in turn became what we would call the folks of the Middle East, you know, Aladdin's, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the cartoon uh, Aladdin when I was a kid or when I was a, a younger person, you know, Aladdin and all that, and the genies and the flying carpets and the Middle East and Saudi Arabia and Iraq and Iran, all those areas are Middle Easterners and they all are descendants essentially of Ishmael and Abraham. Does, there, does everybody, everybody see that? Everybody got that? A real example, and we talked about this before too, is the Palestinians are Ishmaelites. Because in, in Israel, you know, Israel is split right in two. You got those that are God's people saying, This is our land. You got the Palestinians say, Oh, no, this is not your land, it's our land. And they're saying, Our father's Abraham too. And his father is Abraham. They, they really are Abraham. But God said that Isaac is Abraham's only son and that his children have the birthright. That's what he said. And that's what it is. It's, for instance, the same way if my father had a will, and then not in this day that we live today, it's not quite this way, but there was a time that when a will was written, a will was written. You couldn't change it. If you wanted to leave every dime you had to your dog, you could. Nowadays, you know, people can, can you know, they can contend wills and do all these things, and, and, you know, we just have a greedy society. But there was a day when people could just will what they wanted to who they wanted. And then God said, Abraham, I want you to give this land to Isaac. It's his land. It's his people. He's my people. And that's what God did. And, of course, that's where they came from. They came from Ishmael's line. And, of course, God told Ishmael or told uh, Hagar that Ishmael would be a person that was against everybody and everybody would be against him. And, of course, it doesn't take long to watch TV and watch Fox News and CNN and any of the news channels, and you will see that the Middle East is probably the most unstable society that there's ever been, not not has been, I mean, not, not, not at this time. I'm talking about it's never been peaceful in the Middle East. It has always been a very ragged, rough area. They're either fighting somebody else or they're fighting one another. Essentially, Iraqians and Iranians are the same people, but they hate each other. <laughs> and it's just, you know, I, I don't get I just, They just do, and it's just the way it is. Afghanistan and Pakistan are two separate countries, but they're really the same people. It's the, it, it, they just don't like each other. And so they're very turmoil-oriented people, and God prophesied it. And, of course, that's the way it is, and it is so. Muhammad was born in Mecca. Everybody knows what I've talked about Mecca, how that Mecca is the place that they call holy and that Mecca is a place where the Kaaba is and the Kaaba is that cube that people go and that the Muslims go and they worship at. When I say it's a cube, it's just a square building with rags around it. It looks like a tent. It's been decorated to appear to be a tent, but it's essentially just a square building when, when, um, when, Muhammad was born the Kaaba would have been probably a tent it would have just been a square tent obviously they weren't into a lot of the buildings were not as um, solid as they are today he was born in 570 and he was born to a man whose last name was Allah 
That's not a coincidence, by the way. You, you understand what I mean? A man who starts a religion whose God is called Allah, whose last name is Allah, that is not a coincidence. That is a sign of things to come. You understand what I mean by that? And uh, that's just the way it is. The Kaaba, of course, is a place that contained at that time over 360 idols. And uh, we would call all of them idols, but included in those idols was a God called Allah. And that God Allah symbol was that of a crescent. Everybody, everybody knows what I mean by that. I was riding by Winthrop last night, uh, the other day. I, w uh, Saturday, Andy had a ball game, and, and we were coming around, you know, the back. He came out of Woodlawn, and we were coming down that back. It's, a, it's that road that runs between the fairground and, the, and Winthrop itself there, connects the two. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. And as you're going through there, Winthrop has all these flags hanging from different countries. You know, I guess the exchange students and all. And you get there and you see this Saudi Arabian flag hanging there. And it's a giant crescent and a star. You know what that means? It doesn't really mean Saudi Arabia. It means Allah. That's what it, that is their Muslim image. That, that's exactly what that is. They're not, that's not a national image. That is a religious symbol that they display on their flag. And so that crescent is the same crescent that was displayed in Mecca, in the Kaaba, above the moon god, Allah. And that's, that's where it came from, and that's what it is, and that's what you should know. We talked about and we explained how that, um, that Muhammad lied to the people as he became older and became empowered and told them that <clears throat> Abraham had come with Ishmael and built a well and established the city of Mecca. And, of course, I talked about and we've talked about how that when the Romans came through and did a survey of that area that in that day there was no city, there was no time, and that was thousands of years after uh, Abraham and his son had died. Abraham has never been to Mecca, and so that you know that. So the Kaaba had 360 idols inside that place. The 360 idols, the main God, the main one was that God Allah, and it's present, it's, it's a symbol was that same, that very crescent that we see flying on their flags. And so it's important to know that. It's important to understand that. It's kind of unique how that Muhammad taught and began to really push female abuse and female use, Does that, if, if that's a, it's a way to say, because Muhammad was not married until he was 25 years old. He was a poor person. He married a 40-year-old widow, and uh, she was very wealthy, and she proposed to him. And so I just find that uniquely funny that he gets, he gets proposed to <laughs> by somebody who cares for him physically and financially, and, and then he institutes a whole religion of female abuse. And so what that tells you is that Muhammad, and, and, I, and I know this sounds terrible, but he was a user is what that tells you. He just used this widow, and uh, she helped him to uh, go along. By the way, this widow was a, was a Kenite priest's daughter. And a, and a moon worshiper, and her dad was a moon uh, priest. That's what he did, and so he worshiped the moon. And so we find that there's not just coincidence here. We understand how this works. After she died, the widow, he had 12 wives and two concubines. Now, you think about that. He went and got 12 wives as his political and religious authority in, 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 it began to grow he took 12 wives to himself. That's amazing. And, and two of the wives were slaves uh, that he just took. You know, he just took slaves and made them his wives. The two concubines gave themselves to him so that he would, they, would, they felt like God wanted them to give themselves to uh, Muhammad for his sexual pleasure. That was their whole purpose in life. That was their calling. They gave themselves to Muhammad. Now, that's not religion, by the way. That's that, you know, there, there's words they call that in other places, and it's not religion. It's not faith. It's not piety. There's words of immorality. Somebody can say what they want, but a man does not go out and get 14 wives, uh, two of which are slaves. He caused his son, his adopted son, to divorce his wife so that he could take his wife. You know what, the, you know what they call you? A, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a pervert that would be the word I'd use for you you're a pervert if you take your son and you make him divorce your wife so you can have him you're a pervert that, that's what that makes you you are a you have uh, sexual problems when you need 14 wives and somebody would say well you know Solomon had 700 wives and you know what he was 
He was a pervert. He had problems. He had issues. And, you know, God judged him for that. It, it was wrong for him to do it. it was, I don't care if he was the, uh, the, the, the greatest man the world's ever known. If you get 700 wives, you got a problem. That tells me that he had a problem. He had a pride issue. He had a sexual issue. He had all kinds of issues. <laughs> That's just how it is. And men with power will tend to abuse sexual uh, um, uh, priority. If, it, if a man that is humble of means and humble of political power generally will stay within his realm and do his thing. But when you're at, when a man is raised to a powerful state, both financially, politically, and militarily, one of the tendencies they have to ha they 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 go to in excess is generally women because they have the ability and the means to, and nobody can say anything to them about it. Henry the Eighth was that way, and you know we see all those types of things. What's, what's interesting is that the Quran in Surah 4.3 limits the number of wives that a man can have to four. Now, now God tells Muhammad, Muhammad writes it down, you're going to have four wives. Now, what does that tell you about somebody? You know, it'd be like Jesus saying, thou shalt not kill and go around killing people. You know, I just, it just don't make sense to me. I, it just, stuff just blows your mind. You're thinking, what in the world? I mean, it's, it's craziness. That's this crazy talk for somebody to do that. And I don't understand that, but, but it limits them to do that. Uh, it also, in Surah 4 and verse 31, it, 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 it forbids anyone to marry their daughter-in-law. And so he, instead of marrying his daughter-in-law, forced his son to divorce his wife and then took her to his wife. Now that's just, you know, I mean, that's called, you know, <laughs> it's called the, uh, what do you call it, what was that, in legal terms, a loophole. That's what they call it. He found a loophole and he used it. What we're trying to say is that the prophet of the word of God violated the word of God. If Jesus had violated the, the, the things that he preached, could you really take the things he preached as valid. Uh, you, you couldn't do that. If Jesus preached on the Sermon on the Mount and he gave all these things that you should do, then he was the exact opposite of the things you should do. This wouldn't be being carried around 2,000 years later. People wouldn't revere this as special and holy. We would revere it as problemsome. We'd say there's fouls here. There, there, there's, there's, there's problems in it. And the problem becomes the root of the problem. If the root's bad, the product would be bad. And the problem is, is when a person is writing Scripture, and then violating Scripture, of course, it can't be Scripture. It's just not the way it is. All right, we're going to stop right there, and we'll pick up next week. What we're going to do next week is there's two other things we want to get to. We want to get to some, uh, some Muslim, uh, how to deal with Muslims, how to talk with Muslims, ways to try to reach Muslims, and then we want to talk about the last uh, uh, form. There's a, there's a nation of Islam that's here in America, and it's pretty powerful, and it's in the African-American community, and it's known as the nation of Islam. We're going to talk about that and, and talk about how that not even the real Muslims, rec they don't even recognize them. So uh, that's how far off their beliefs are. That they, don't, they think they're crazy. So it's, it's just a crazy belief system there. I know that's terrible, isn't it? But they do. <laughs> it's bad because theirs, theirs are out there too. All right, we're done, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll start back next week.